So to help us with our discipling ministry, we want to make sure that the environment, the overall environment of our church, of our individual ministries, it's a healthy environment that is one that will help our people grow, that they're constantly being challenged as we invite them to go deeper in their relationship with the Lord. Again, we're keeping in mind how we have defined what a true healthy disciple looks like. Well, to get us there to that, to that level of, um, of following the Lord, we're going to need to be consistently pushing and challenging our people as, as we ourselves are also growing. And so Jesus, this is where Jesus existed. This is where he thrived. He thrived in an atmosphere that was a true uh, disciple-making culture. And so he had this great knack for inviting people to be with him. He would extend a lot of invitations to come and be with him, to follow him, to be a part of his ministry. But when people would come along, they would check out what he was teaching, what he was doing. That's when he would, he would drop those, those heavy phrases on them, like uh, what they're actually going to be required to do. If you want to be my disciple, then here's what I'm going to ask of you to do or to be. And so for a lot of people, scared them off. And I know that the disciples probably got a little bit frustrated, right? Because it was like a lot of times when Jesus would have the biggest crowds, he would say the hardest things. So for the disciples, if you think of the 12, they've given up their family businesses. They've given up everything to follow this guy who is teaching like nobody else, nothing they, like they've ever heard before. And so when they start seeing big crowds coming around, they're probably getting excited, right? So they're probably thinking, this is awesome. People are kind of getting on board with us. I think we've chosen the right guy here. And then he would have, Jesus would have thousands and he would say stuff like, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to hate your father, your mother, your kids, hate your spouse, hate your own life and love me more. Or eat my flesh and drink my blood. You know, I can just imagine the disciples are back there going, oh my gosh, not the flesh and blood thing again. He's scaring them off, you know, because they're wanting people to rally to their cause. But Jesus paints a picture that is accurate for, what's it, for what it's going to cost people to actually follow him, right? So there's no easy believism in, in Jesus' teaching. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at another tool from Mike Breen that is called the Invitation Challenge Matrix to make sure that what we are presenting in our ministries is one that is conducive for making disciples. We want to make sure that we stay away from being heavy on, too heavy on certain aspects. Here's what I mean. So if we have this matrix and we say that this is high on this side and this side. All right, so here on the vertical line, we're going to say this is our invitation. This is the invitation side, that vertical line, and the horizontal line will be our challenge. And so down here would be our low. And to the left is low. So if you have an atmosphere in your church or in your ministry that is high on invitation, but low, over here, we'll start with this quadrant here, but it's low on challenge. Here's what that means. The invitation is, y'all come and be with us. Come and follow. Come and be physically in our proximity. There's just this invitation to come and be. The challenge is, why are we getting together? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of us getting together? So what if you have high invitation, y'all come be with us, but you're low on challenge? What kind of atmosphere does that begin to foster? Well, for some people, they're just going to get kind of comfortable when they do this. Because if all you're doing is just getting together for the sake of being together, that's good as far as relationships. But if there's no purpose to it, then people are going to get kind of cozy. They're going to eventually just be pure lazy, right? 
if there's no challenge, but they're getting together. So let's move to the next section. So in this quadrant, what if you have low challenge and now low invitation? I mean, there's really, there's no purpose and there's no even personal invite. It's almost as if, hey, you, you've, you found our church, congratulations. Just don't take my pew, right? I've got my, my, my Afghan blanket sitting on my pew, don't move it, don't get my spot, right? So what kind of atmosphere, what kind of attitude does that kind of create when there's no invite and there's no challenge? Your people are going to be bored, like even to the point of death almost. There's this sense of this is like a cemetery because there's nothing going on. There's no relationship and there's no purpose going on. So in this quadrant, what if you have low invitation, but you have a high challenge? The job, the challenge is always before us. Like there's a lot to be done. We've got to get uh, the service projects done. We've got to get our numbers up. We've got to get budget numbers up, baptisms up. We've got a lot of work to be done, but just I'm going to go send you to go do these things. And there's very little invitation, personal relationship as these tasks are being done. What kind of attitude does that create? This one, that's gonna be kind of discouraging, right? So if, if you're discouraged while working, that's eventually going to lead to burnout. If you're doing a lot of work with very little relationship and encouragement, you're gonna probably eventually burn out if you hang in there. So, here's the good news. This is where Jesus existed. Because look, we don't want our ministries to be just all about getting together all the time uh, with, with no purpose. And we certainly don't want our ministry to exist over here uh, where we're getting together and absolutely no challenge at all. Um, and we're not even asking people to get together. And here, we don't want our ministries to just simply accomplish a lot of stuff, but at the cost of our people leaving and being burned out and discouraged. Jesus, his, uh, his culture that he created with him and his followers, with his disciples, was found in that Jesus offered himself. He offered uh, to be in proximity of his people and to walk with them. And then he would teach them as they went. He would challenge them as they ministered together. And so you would see things such as Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is a great example of how Jesus created this trajectory. He wanted his people to move in this upward trajectory, in this disciple-making culture. Matthew 16, he said... All right, whoever wants to be my disciple, you can. But here's what you're going to have to do. So there's the invitation. Whoever wants to be my disciple, open invitation. But you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. So, high invitation. You want to you wanna apply for the job of being my disciple? Come on, biggin. You got it but here's what it's going to cost you. And here's the challenge. You're going to have to deny yourself, take up your death instrument, because at that point when he said, take up, my cro take up your cross, the cross hadn't been romanticized like we have uh, knowledge of it today. Take up your death instrument daily and then follow me. And so for those who followed him, they gave up a lot to be able to do that. And so this was that disciple-making culture that the disciples grew through and that Jesus continually operated out of. So, real quick, what if, and because if, if, if you're dealing with a young church, a new church, hopefully you get to start here. You get to build from the foundation up. You get to build the atmosphere that is most conducive for healthy disciple making. But if you find yourself dealing with these other quadrants of atmosphere, can you go from here to here? Absolutely. 
And Mike Breen would call this the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, and I can, I can tell you uh, two stories. We don't have time to tell both of them, but I can tell you two examples of two different churches that experienced this transition. I personally got to walk with a group uh, as student pastor from this quadrant to this quadrant. And it was like building beneath the waterline. A fellow um, student pastor in, a, in, a, in a, one of my former towns that I was serving in, he had already started walking his people through this and I was right behind him. I knew that's where we wanted to go. We wanted to be healthy in making disciples. And so he encouraged me and he told me about this story about um, building beneath the waterline. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a book based on building the Brooklyn Bridge. But here's why this was so important at the time. Because when you start taking things away as far as entertainment, as far as making people less cozy and lazy, it's going to be uncomfortable. And people are going to complain. As they move from quadrant to quadrant, they're going to have more burden put on them, but it should be through relationships that we do this, that we walk our people through this. And understand, this can take years. So building beneath the waterline, the story goes that there was, um, that when the city of Brooklyn voted to to allocate the funds to build the Brooklyn Bridge, that uh, after the first year, after it was approved, they started construction. But after the first year, the money was being used and being depleted, but there was no visible signs of progress. People were complaining, obviously. Second year goes by, same thing happened. The funds are being spent, but there's no progress, no visible progress that the people could see. I think it was around the third or the fourth year. This keeps ticking along. The money's being spent, but there's no visible progress until about the third or fourth year when the foundation of the bridge started coming out of the water. And the people were like, oh, okay. So all this time you have been doing what you said you would do, but we just couldn't see it. That's here. And for some of the people, it's gonna be difficult to understand until you have a good number of folks in your ministries that are arriving here, it's difficult if you're taking an existing ministry from where it is to becoming more healthy, to becoming healthier and in disciple making strategy. It takes patience and it takes fortitude, but it is possible. And so let me give you real quick two questions that I like to use here with the groups that I work with and even in my own life. There are two questions I like to use to help make sure that I'm growing, that this is happening in my own life and in the life of the people that I'm discipling. Question number one, very simple. What has God taught you lately? Because if you consider what is God teaching me and if, and if, and if I have to think back more than a month, then that means that there is something wrong with me. Right, Because if I'm trying to live out 2 Corinthians 3.18, if I'm trying to grow in the image of Jesus, I've got a long way to go. And I know God has a lot to teach me and change in me. We all do. And so that basic question, what is God teaching you? Or what has God done in your life lately? It's foundational. And then the second question, the follow-up to that is, so what are you doing about that? Whatever it is God's teaching you, it's got to move you to being more obedient to Christ, looking more like Christ. So what are you doing about it? So as far as our ministries go, we want to make sure that this is the quadrant, that we are consistently inviting our people to be part of and to be like doing this life on life thing together and growing in Christ. But when we get together, there's always a purpose and there's always a, a true biblical challenge. That will help us to have a true uh, disciple-making culture in our ministries.